telly. That's good. <laughs> Roy just said, is this being filmed? Unfortunately, it is, Roy. We're going to have to live with the consequences. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Game Changer interview with Amazon's Vice President of uh, Amazon Studios, rather, Roy Price. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about Amazon's very considerable creative success that it's had over the past year. Are you filming me now? No, I just took a They're picture. They're filming. You don't need to do that. Oh, one picture. Jeez, you're so iconoclastic, That's US people. point of view. Listen, Roy, honestly. Um, uh, <laughs> we're going to be talking about the arms race in terms of content and the new entrance in the s Ford market. And on a personal note, I am going to be thanking Roy for still holding the record for having spent the most amount of money on a former BBC show. Something I'm personally very grateful for, so thank you very much for that, Roy. <laughs> but first of all, let's have a look at what Amazon have been up to in the past year. I think that looks incredibly impressive. Um, that's Works a little better when it's really loud, but you get You the need idea. it louder. Okay, do you yeah, want us to play it yeah. again? Let's do it we'll again. Do... No, let's do it again. Um, you said something interesting in MIP recently, that quality-wise you think you're there creatively. Is that how it feels? It's been quite a journey, but you've had extraordinary recognition in the past year. Emmys, Golden Globes, and Oscar for Manchester by the Seas. Do you feel you've made it creatively now? Yes, I think uh, being critically well received is our bag. So um, no, I, I think a lot of a, a lot of great work, a lot of great shows, transparent uh, has sort of led the way and and done great. But uh, catastrophe and Fleabag, uh, Mozart in the Jungle, a lot of you know very well received uh, stuff. So that's a great way to start, and I, I think that's been true. In adult TV, uh, where you know we won the Golden Globe a couple years in, in a row uh, for best comedy, but also movies. We won a few Oscars last year for Manchester by the Sea, and uh, and in kids TV as well. Tumble Leaf has done uh, very well in the awards scene, so I think uh, that's a good good way to start. I think it's amazing when you see that, Tony, we were talking briefly about this earlier, that you are in such a broad space now, that there are so many different sorts of shows there. I mean, for producers in the room, if you were to sort of say, what is the defining feature of an Amazon show? Do you have in your mind how you would articulate that? You know, it, it's hard to um, put it exactly, but obviously you, uh, you have to differentiate, you know, and you want something that has uh, a clear vision uh, if you're going to differentiate against the many, many shows that are, that are out there, I think a show has to have a distinctive voice. And at the end of the day, uh, I think the only way to get that is to find a, find a creator who's super talented, has a strong vision for a show, doing something new, and really support their distinctive vision. Uh, you can't like try to get them to do a show your way or like I'm going to tell you how to make a comedy because uh, then they're all going to be the same. They're not going to stand out. It really has to be about, you know, what is the unique voice of that creator and that show? So it's and that's, I feel like it's mostly about that. Sure, but that's getting harder and harder, isn't it? Not least because of the demand in premium content and all of the new entrants. There's a great expression that you used in an interview recently. Returns on ordinary are rapidly declining. And I think it's a oh, great I'll phrase say. that because I think everyone in the room would recognize that. Yeah. But in a sense, then, you're putting the bar in a really high place because you're looking for strong authorial voices. It's got to be exceptional. It's got to stand out from the crowd. I mean, is it realistic for you to set the bar in that place and really deliver? Or does that mean you buy less? Or where does that get you? Well, you know, you've got to be very differentiated, distinctive, new, different. But at the same time, uh, you do have to get a lot of viewers, you know. So I think that's a bit of a conundrum, and, and some shows get both, you know, like Game of Thrones or something. Um, but that's, you know, that is the goal. You really want to have, uh, try, to, try to get both of those. But I, I think you, you do have to hold the line at, you know, having it feel real and moving and, and uh, distinctive and try to deliver that every time. So one of the big interventions you've made, which you know, everyone in the room will know about, is the way you run your pilot system. And in a weird way, you could say, well, that gives you tentacles out into communities that wouldn't necessarily pitch to a platform otherwise. Do you think that's got you to a different place from where, for example, Netflix have got to with going straight to series? Has the pilot system given you different sorts of voices? I think it's been, it's been helpful. Uh, you know, it's always helpful to get feedback. Uh, we also go to Amazon customers and, and ask about premises and casting. And so you get a lot of customer feedback into the process. I think that pilots are going to have to play probably less of a role going forward because 
um, the reality is they sort of slow you down. You know, it's another 10 months between sitting at a table saying, that's an amazing idea for a TV show, and having the TV show on the air. You know, it's, it's normally, you know, 12 to 18 months, but with a pilot, it's, it's like two years. So but who has the time? that's quite a big shift then, isn't it? Because actually one of the big pitches you made, and actually it's very striking if you go on the Amazon website, I'm sure a lot of people have, it feels very democratized that anyone could pitch an idea, they could pitch a development. And yet when you look at where you've gravitated talent-wise, probably inevitably it is to sort of Woody Allen and Peter Sarovinovich Sar because right. you've got those big name talent. So you're now saying you can see a scenario where that many flowers will bloom strategy is less important and you may gravitate straight to series with big name talent? Is that well, where this will go? Yeah, and I think the reality of the marketplace is, you know, it's competitive and often you, ju you just have to go to series. So that's, that's the reality of the marketplace. So both from a timing point of view and a competitive point of view, uh, I think we, we have a few pilots in the works now, but I, I think there will be fewer than before. We still have customer feedback, but, um, uh, but we'll, we'll probably have fewer pilots for sure. Do you think that whole system has got you to be a bit of a boutique platform that you have, and we talked a bit about this earlier, fantastic shows that audiences love that stop churn, but they're not necessarily delivering huge volume. And I suppose Transparent is the epitome of that, a show I think everyone can see is critically rather extraordinary, but probably wouldn't get a big audience. Do you think that the pilot system's been part of that or? Um, well, you know, I, uh, I think some of the, some of the shows are are bigger, but, but I think that's, that's always the thing to balance. I mean, Grand Tour definitely drives a lot of viewership, American Gods, Man in the High Castle, big volume shows. Um, and then, but there's also a place for, uh, for some of the shows that don't have the same volume, but are bringing some uh, critical attention. And, you know, a show should deliver uh, an audience, or a lot of publicity and sort of reputational brand benefit, or ideally both. And um, I think in the US, the, the award scene has evolved a little bit that is more difficult for the, the shows with smaller viewership. Uh, just this year, it's oriented around um, the, the process has, has uh, let it favor shows with a higher viewership. And I think that'll be challenging for some of those um, smaller shows. So you, you really have to look for uh, a premise that is big, that can address a large audience and still delivers that kind of, you know, great characters and, and a really distinctive narrative and subject. I'm so smiling because I'm sure there are lots of broadcasters and, and producers in the room who will recognize what you described as the way you'd run a traditional broadcaster. And does that feel right. like where you're going? Do you feel much more as if you're going to be a big, broad platform that operates in a much more conventional space, that pilots become less significant, you're pitching in for big series with all traditional broadcasters and US Ford entrants, and it's just a big, broad entertainment proposition? Well, I think it's, it's got to be a big, it is a big, broad platform. I mean, now we're, we're open all around the world. Uh, in the past year, we launched in 240 countries and, and territories. And, uh, you know, it's a big, broad, mass market thing, but, but hopefully also uh, distinctive and differentiated and special. And, you know, I mean, in the U.S. we have Thursday Night Football, and here we have Grand Tour. And um, uh, so, you know, as I said, trying to, trying to get both into one show, I think, is, the, is, is what we're looking for now. I get that. One of the things I think is fascinating for people who don't work in the S4 market is the way you use data. And it's the sort of the dark arts of the S4 player. You've got access to material, you don't disclose your figures, but you can see what's going on. And it's striking when you first started talking on platforms, you talked a lot about how understanding the customer behavior informed what you did. And yet I saw recently you were quite irate with an interviewer who'd implied that a creative had been asked to work writing to a particular demographic. So, so where are you now with all of that? How are you using the data? Uh, well, you know, primarily you, you can look at just how many people are you getting. And at the end of the day, uh, a show has to deliver an audience, just, just like anywhere. Uh, you can also look at how many of the, of the people who started watching the show actually finish the show. <clears throat> uh, and that indicates something. We don't do too much with demographics uh, because, you know, we don't really care 
what the demographic is. We're not selling ads, so it, it could be younger, older, it doesn't matter. It should just be a lot of people. Uh, but, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't think that, um, I think if you're going to really back someone's vision, you, you don't want to be saying too much like, oh, well, let's have a scene for this group, or let's have a scene for that group, or, you know, well, could you include the thing a dog? That people find fascinating, and this is probably just paranoia on the part of traditional broadcasters, and for as long as I'm one, I'll ask the paranoid question. And it, it goes like this, I suppose. So that's what you say, because to the creative community, that's exactly what you should say. No one wants to be told that they're writing to a brief or that you've run an ROI on, a, on an idea. But is that what's really going on? Or are you really sitting there going, that worked, we'd quite like something else like this? Um, well, I, I don't think the numbers can really tell you, like, you know, where the show should go, you know, in season, in season two. Yeah. So, uh, so I think they're, they're sort of separate but related processes. We don't, we don't there's, there's never a meeting where, like, we look at a lot of charts and then we say, therefore, you know, the character, they have to break up by the end of season two or, you know, whatever it is. Um, but might you say rom-coms knocking out of the ballpark, we definitely want more rom-coms. So do you use it to yeah. be much more granular well, in terms sure. of your brief? Yeah, fine. Yeah, from a genre point of view. And what's the other thing that's very striking since you were here last year is how quickly your sector is changing. So even since you were last here, you've got Apple coming in with a billion dollars going into original content. You've got right. Facebook moving into that space. Do you think that Amazon has a natural advantage? And if so, what do you think that is? Well, you know, I, I think there are always going to be new players and there are many, many players. So, so we tend not to think too much about, you know, Netflix in particular, Apple in particular, whatever. They're just, there are always a lot of, a lot of players. I, I think, you know, focus on the customers, focus on the shows. Um, I do think that... Uh, the example of Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones to me is kind of like uh, is to television what maybe you know Jaws was to movies after a lot of the 70s of making uh, a certain kind of movie or Hollywood not being sure what to do. Jaws and Star Wars came out and definitely set an example and I, I think um, one thing that's an example of is thinking out of the box in terms of making it bigger, more cinematic and having bigger bigger budgets, so uh, bigger world, bigger budgets. Uh, I think that's, that's something that I would anticipate you know, throughout the marketplace. Which is fascinating, but I suppose the, the other thing that's interesting that I find surprising, if I were working for Amazon, I would say, I don't worry about the competitors because I've got the best diversified business you could ever possibly hope to have. Because as people are marching across the world, you are part of this extraordinary retail organization, and yet it's not something that you guys tend to talk about very much. Is that very deliberate that you say, look, they do that and we do this, and you can't see a world in which there's more cross-fertilization of ideas and more direct value from the content through to the retail side? Well, I mean, Prime is the best deal of all time, and everybody on Earth should be subscribed to he Prime. He says this I mean, every time in an interview. Honestly, no, it's like cheap advertising. There's no you just question did that. about that. I mean, I'll give you, they'll give you a video service, I'll give you a video service, and then the shipping, and then the music, and then everything else. So, uh, so I think it's a major advantage in terms of just getting subscribers and growing the service. Uh, it's, you know, it is, I think that it's, it's great, but... Um, uh, from a creative point of view, I think it's a similar challenge, though. But if, but if, I suppose what I'm getting to is if you sit there and think, okay, because even in one year, it's fundamentally different from last year because of these new entrants. Do, why wouldn't you sit there and say, right, okay, so the tick wears a great blue costume. There's going to be a click-through service where I can buy that. It wouldn't suit me. I should just quickly say that. But, but th that seems a very natural extension of where you are creatively, and yet you're very clear. I've never heard you talk about it, or in fact, anyone from Amazon talk about that interrelationship. And is that deliberate? Well, we could do that. I might just write that <laughs> down. But, uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, you just, it's hard enough to make a great show without also saying, you know, and please, you know, please focus on this product or, or something. So we, we keep the, the show process pretty um, insulated from any other influences. So it's all about Prime. I don't know if Roy yeah. mentioned this. Apparently, it's excellent value, though, so you should be fully aware of that. But yeah. um, uh, I mean, clearly, what's driving Prime is your shows, isn't it? So we've got a clip now of the Tick, which is launching today. Do you want to Launches talk a little bit today. about it? Yeah, super, super fun. Uh, it's, it's a superhero show, with, but with a new, you know, contemporary and hilarious spin. So let's have a look. Yeah. 
falling. One of humanity's most feared and misunderstood conditions. The key to successful falling lies in realizing that you are a falling person. Do you go stiff? Resist the fall like a standing person. Or do you accept it? Like a defenestrated feline. And stay alert to each and every falling opportunity. Tech! Uh, wonderfully crazy show, huge scale to that, on like Electric Dreams right. and American Gods. Um, what else have you got coming up that you're excited about? Well, we have The Tick today. We have uh, Grand Tour uh, this year for season two. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, a number of, of British co-pros coming up, whether it's um, uh, Britannia or Tin Star or Vanity Fair. Uh, so we're doing a lot of a lot of business over here uh, and growing our presence in London. Um, and then in the new year, we have Jack Ryan, which is a big uh, international action show in the middle of the year. And you know, at the end of the day, I do think it's about uh, it's about the talent, it's about the team. And uh, so. As I look around and say, who are we working with? You know, Matt Weiner is mm -hmm. working on a show. Um, David O. Russell, uh, Wong Kar Wai, uh, Amy Sherman Palladino comes out with Marvelous Mrs. Maisel uh, by the end of the year. Jill Soloway, uh, we just greenlit season five of Transparent. So it's an awesome, awesome team and I feel good about what we have to look forward to. We're going to start shooting Carnival Row soon, which is a big fantasy uh, sort of mystery show. And, uh, and I guess we're announcing now that uh, Orlando Bloom is going to star in that. So that's going to be awesome. And there's, I mean, there's a lot of great stuff in the works. So loads of stuff coming up. I suppose critically, it'll be interesting for producers to know as well. Because you live in a rather wonderful, I'm envious of it, world of non-disclosure on information, mm -hmm. um, how do you assess success? So with all those shows, what are you looking for? So the tick launches today. What you'll be looking at how many people are watching it, where they're watching it. You're looking at churn. You're looking at whether it's bringing people in. What, are any of those more or less important than others? Uh, I think viewership is, is fundamental and then, you know, does it appear to be influencing, you know, whether people are signing up for the service uh, or, uh, you know, sort of re-signing up. Uh, and those are, the, those are the most important things for sure. And are you disclosing that now to producers or you're still quite reluctant to give that information out? No, we still keep that a secret. So can I just talk to you about that, partly because I just think that sounds ruddy But we'll marvelous, sort of, you know, honest. make implications. Um, so creatively, what effect, because I can't get my head around what effect that has on an organization, because to a certain extent, the world we live in, in, in trustful broadcasting, digital broadcasting, where all of the data is out there, it's just one big roller coaster ride of, you know, triumph and disaster, and it leads <laughs> to a particular type of creative conversation. Yeah. Controlling your own narrative in the way that you do by saying that's successful because I said it is, which is brilliant. Um, how does that affect the creative conversation? Does it make you more likely to talk about failure, less likely to talk about failure? I'm just really interested about the effect it has culturally on an organization. Well, we will talk to producers about, you know, how things are doing generally. It's just, uh, you know, we don't have to refer to the, the specific numbers, but just, you know, it's high, it's low, it's going up, it's going down. Um, you know, everybody stopped watching after episode four, so please don't do that again. Uh, you know, stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, the important thing is to see the numbers on a relative basis. So, uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that internally. It's sort of brilliant though, isn't it? Because you can then say that's very successful and nobody knows if it's very successful or not. And I think that's a sort of fantastic world to live in because you can tell your own story as an organization and I think that must be quite refreshing. It's a genuine, it's a genuine question because to a certain extent otherwise creative organizations are buffeted aren't they by those highs and lows but you are immune from that and I just wonder if that is a more pleasurable place to be. Well I also do that with my home cooking so I'll, <laughs> I'll make dinner and then serve it and I'll say that was very successful <laughs> and it, it doesn't you know whether anyone liked it or not no, but I mean there's, there's a lot of feedback you get 
you know, reviews from customers, of yeah. course, and we get many of those around the world. Uh, viewership, critical reviews. I mean, there's a lot of feedback on how things, things are doing, and we do convey that to the producers. Okay, let's talk about the UK, because there's obviously a massive thing, particularly for people in this room, that you have invested to the extent that you have in growing this particular sector. What was that about? Is it because you think the UK sector has got something that no one else has got that they can provide that you wouldn't get elsewhere in the world? Well, I, I don't know what to say. It's like Britain's got talent or something. There, there are um, just a lot of good writers and producers and shows. And, you know, so we realized there were a lot of opportunities coming out of the UK. And so we have a lot of UK shows now. And uh, we didn't have an office here. We would always visit. And so now we, I mean, we had an office, but it was more of a business marketing office. Now we have a, a growing development team. Georgia Brown came over and leads that and uh, so now we have a we have a strong presence here I, I think i could spend a large part of the year in london and be you know perfectly effective and is that because in the end um you've got some 20 percent cut through in this market haven't you versus 64 percent, i think in america is it that you want great indigenous british content that's going to drive prime subscription assuming that your pitch today hasn't done enough which it probably has roy to be fair probably but has. um uh is that what it's about? It's about great British content to drive prime subscription here? Or is it about great, great British content that can travel? It's really great British content. It's both, but, uh, but a lot of the great British shows can travel around the world. I mean, uh, The Grand Tour and American Gods are two of our top shows all around the world. So, um, you know, we're uh, between American Gods and Good Omens, I think we're, we're going to be uh, sort of the uh, home of Neil Gaiman to some extent, and uh, they're just a great, a lot of great shows that I think have, uh, that are global in their appeal. So in terms of Georgia then, so it's a fantastic job, um, and sorry to get granular about it, but I know this will matter to people in the room, particularly people who've got relationships with Morgan or Joe. What can she sign off? So can she say, yes, please, I would like that show, or does she have to wait for LA to wake up, or how does it work? Well, we do have a system where we sort of have to agree um, so we would, we would have a chat before we green light a show, but there's, it's not a big committee and it's the same for, you know, the movie department or kids or U S shows or, or, uh, British shows. So, but it's, you know, we can, uh, just have a quick conversation. It doesn't take a month or anything. So couple Bruce, Bruce, is it a couple of days? So it's, if someone comes in and George says, I'm interested, then it goes up the food chain back to LA and then it comes back down again, and then you've got a green light. Is that how it works? Well, not, not to put something into development, but to actually green light the show, we'll have to chat about it, yeah. Okay. I'd like to know what it is. Okay, all right. <laughs> you know? it's, not, it's not entirely un unreasonable, that. Um, one other thing I'm very fascinated in is this area of co-production, and I talked about a bit earlier in the festival, about the extent to which the end game for you and for all the other SVOD players has to be about originals, because that's what you're mm -hmm. going to want, to have that global footprint. You were talking earlier, particularly in the UK, massive co-production slate, Fleabag, Catastrophe, yeah. Electric Dreams with Us, Britannia with Sky, Vanity Fair with ITV. Can you imagine in two or three years' time it'll still look like that? Or do you think you'll get to the point where this is a sort of transitional phase for Amazon? They've been very helpful relationships, but you can now do it without them. I think it will still look like that. Um, you know... We're not religious about the deals. We're, we really just prioritize getting great shows. So uh, we're not going to develop every single great show in the world. So if it comes from Channel 4 or ITV or BBC or whatever, uh, so be it. And we'll always be open to that. So I think that'll stay the same. Um, the only thing that becomes a little challenging is, you know, if we want the show to be bigger and the budget gets bigger, uh, people have to kind of, you know, come along or at some point it doesn't make sense. And then, you know, we'll just take the whole show. Um, but, but, you know, obviously we've had a lot that, of success. That sent shivers down my spine. Can you just say that again? What? That, that bit about taking the whole show. So what, so what you're saying is that British producers can pitch to you with a, with a broadcaster attached, but if after a certain point you want to make 11 million episodes of it and the broadcaster doesn't, then you can imagine a world in which you evolve to just pick that stuff up. Yeah, or, you know, if the right version of the show for the global market really is going to cost, you know, $8 million an episode and, you know, you're only in for $1 million or so, at some point it stops making, it, it stops being fair. Yeah. And, um, you know, so people have to sort of, 
come along to the right budget. We have to agree on that. Okay. That's quite chilling. Um, uh, <laughs> in terms of what that means for UK producers, because there is still and there remains an almost comical disparity, isn't there, between tariffs in America, particularly in scripted and in the UK. Ballpark, what sorts of numbers are you looking at? We'll come on to non-scripted in a moment. But in terms of scripted hours, do you have a, a sense of that's the tariff that you're looking for to commission at scale? It really varies. You know, if it's, um, if it's a drama or something, uh, it... It's you know it's pretty normal, but but I'd say that the uh, the ceiling in television has been going up every year, so so it can be let's say a normal show is you know four five six million an hour dollars. Yeah, uh, you know there are shows that are twice that, so uh, it'll vary. I don't think I have any shows that cost anything like that. Yeah, well you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm going to get some though, definitely, definitely going to do that. Um, I, we talked earlier about how broad your platform has now been, and uh, quite apart from the new entrants in the past year, the very striking thing has been you expanding in all sorts of interesting areas into genres you weren't in before. One of the questions here, is Amazon's recent acquisition of the ATP tennis part of a wider strategy around sport? Clearly you've got NFL in America as well. But that's a big play. I mean, BT have been a huge disruptor in this market in sports rights. Do you see yourself continuing to be in that space? Well, I don't know anything about the ATP, but um, uh, so that may or may not uh, have happened. But um, just what does that mean? That that's not an official. Yeah. Um, but you know, looks at press woman who avoids rumor. gays. I see. Uh, but you know, look, people love sport. It's big. Um, engaging really motivates people, so I think that's a good opportunity. But can you imagine that become a very substantial part of your sell in the years ahead? Because clearly, it's, I mean, that is an arms race all of its own, the sports rights business on a global scale. Yeah, it could. Yeah, it's broad, it's distinctive, people care about it, motivates people. Yes. So live sport could be a key part of Amazon in the future. Uh, I think it's an opportunity we'll definitely explore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What about children's? Because it's, it's a real thorny issue in this market. Notoriously difficult for commercial broadcasters to monetize children's content. And you and Netflix have both become quite substantial commissioners there. Is that going to continue? Are you looking for kids' shows from the British market as well? Well, we've been active here and uh, we're very proud of the work we've done uh, to date. And uh, it is important to uh, customers. There are a lot of um, sources of kids' content and you don't have like stars in the kids market. It can be difficult to generate publicity in the same ways, but so there are challenges, but, uh, but we're happy with what we've done so far. And does that make sense for you because it's bringing in a whole other base, audience base into Prime or does it stop churn because you're getting family viewing or how is it working for you? Well, I, I think there's a part of the audience to whom uh, that genre is quite important. So you wanna pay attention to that if you can develop a distinct profile in that area, then that's an opportunity. I think it, it is more challenging because you don't get the same like press attention, you don't have stars. Uh, so it's a little more challenging to develop a brand in that area. If you look at the range of what you've got, and I want to come on to non-scripted in a moment, do you have a sense in the next two or three years where the mix will set? What proportion would be in scripted, in drama and comedy? What proportion would be live sport, kids? Is there, do you have that? in your mind? I think we'll have to follow the audience on that one. Uh, scripted television, scripted and unscripted, sort of put them together. Uh, I think, you know, will always be a very substantial part of what we do. But I think it'll grow. Let's talk about non-scripted, because clearly, in terms of your relationship with this market, probably the biggest thing has been Grand Tour. And yeah. I, for one, would like to ask you, what on earth induced you to take a BBC show? Oh, well, you know. <laughs> Uh, I mean, what a great show, and it's, it's, it's done very well for us. Uh, people love it around the world. Uh, so, you know, we're super happy with the Grand Tour, looking forward to season two, uh, which is very fun. I hope Jeremy gets better soon. Uh, although I did see a picture of him in the paper a couple of days in Ibiza, so it <laughs> seems like maybe he's not doing too badly. But uh, uh, so... You know, I, I would expect more down that road, and that show has the scale that, uh, that we're looking for, ideally. It feels ironic for me to be asking you this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Has it done enough for you, that show? Yes, that, I would take four more of those any day. 
And could you ever imagine a scenario where you would sell a second window of that back to another broadcaster? Yes, conceivably. We could try that. That's interesting. So, so that an Amazon original could be co-produced with you premiering it and then having a different sort of relationship with global broadcaster. Yeah, I think it depends what the holdback is. Uh, so, you know, could it be a year or two? You know, we'd have to work that out. But, uh, you know, it's conceivable. One of the things I find fascinating when you pick that show up is when I was on BBC One, I watched successive BBC Two controllers struggle with the challenging behaviour of the stars, might be one way of putting it. How have they been for you? Have they been easy to work with, difficult to work with? Great. Seems great so far. <laughs> uh, no problems. But this is a sort of one of the great things that comes out of SVOD commissioning, which I find fascinating. And I think there'll be lots of creatives in the room who, who hear this message as well. Come to Amazon, come to Netflix, come to wherever it is, and you get a level of creative freedom you wouldn't get anywhere else. Is that true? I mean, what, when you pick something up, what would a normal level of engagement be with, with the talent or the producer? I think it is true, you know. Uh, we don't get into business with people to give them a lot of notes. I mean, sometimes we do have a point of view, but, um, you know, if they're perfectly capable of producing a great show and without having a lot of extensive conversations, I'm happy to do that. Uh, you know, that's all the easier for us. So, you know, I do think that um, we're very, very oriented around supporting the voice of whoever is creating the show. And I think the feedback we've gotten from producers is that they've had a great experience making their shows. So okay. it seems to be working so far. I think we get a chance to have a quick look at Grand Tour. It's clearly opened the door for non-scripted, and I think that's a great moment. Fantastically strong tradition in this market, particularly around non-scripted. Can you give us a sense of how you see that evolving? I mean, do you think you, that you will be more in the market of picking up shows that have already had eyeballs to them, like Grand Tour, or are you looking for big non-scripted originals? And if so, in what sorts of areas? I think both. I think the, uh, if something already has a big brand and for some reason it's available, that's very interesting. Uh, but anything that could be big, uh, could be great. Now, I don't really differentiate that much between unscripted and scripted. It's just, you know, is it interesting television? Do you want to watch it? Is it compelling? Could it really motivate you to, you know, go see it? And if the answer is yes, then let's do it. But could that be big shiny floor show? Is it big factual entertainment shows? Is it, you know, documentary that presents as, as scripted in, in terms of how it plays it, out with the it audience? It could be or? any of that. I, I think, you know, you. Things always change, the things that work may surprise you, so I don't want to be too locked in you know, to what it has to be. Um, but anything that feels new and interesting and big, we could do. Okay. Let's talk very briefly about the features business, because again, you've got a very different position here from Netflix, haven't you, mm -hmm. that you're prepared to support features going for cinematic release. Um, and you've had success. We talked about Manchester by the Sea, but I think there are other films as well. Peter Liu coming along in collaboration yeah. with Channel 4. What's your position there? Because again, very difficult area for a lot of people to make good money out of. Is it that you're buying late and therefore you're in a better position financially on them? Or, or how do you see that evolving as part of your business? Well, I think like anything, you want to develop a distinctive selection that uh, people appreciate for some uh, characteristic. And I, I think we have a strong uh, movie lineup in sort of the more interesting, you know, prestige type uh, movies, so yeah. the you know movies that you'll see at the BAFTAs will generally uh, have a high percentage of those, and um, and there's an audience that appreciates that. So we've been we've been kind of focused on that area to date. Okay, right. I'll take some questions here now. Um, I think this is an interesting one. It goes back to what we were saying earlier about if you particularly if you move away from the pilot system. To what extent are you then going to be in that place where you can nurture new talent? So the question is, you're chasing big names, big writers, big directors, but what is Amazon willing to do to nurture new talent? Well, you know, particularly without pilots, you, you always have to put yourself in that, uh, that mode, you know, mentally, where you were in the beginning, uh, where you really, 
want to take a chance on something new. You, you never want to get into the mentality where either A, uh, all the new stuff has to feel like all the old stuff, you know, kind of like, um, you know, Motown or something, like it's all got a similar sound. Uh, because then you're going to miss the next thing. And um, uh, so, uh, you know, and, and B, you don't want to be locked into, uh, I mean, you, you want established talent. We're working with many great people, but, but you always want to remind yourself, you know, to be open to the great new idea. So, uh, so you really just have to, you know, have the discipline to stay open-minded and don't, suddenly change gears to become really conservative and ordinary because that's the feels uh, less risky but in fact it's more risky there's nothing more boring than repeating yourself well, I think that's exactly right but I think that it's fascinating what you said earlier about the pilot system because that was a key differentiator for you that there was a point of entry for new talent and yet as we said in the past year you've got lots of big players coming in with big checkbooks and you're part of a pitching process of A-list talent going around saying you know buy my show buy my show and sort of what you're saying is you're inevitably going to be, have to become part of that. So will that make it harder for you to find those voices? Well, if you have enough shows, you, you can do both. Um, but, you know, the real openness to new talent is, is before the pilots, you know, when you're picking the pilots. So just I think you have to take that mentality and apply it to picking shows and remind yourself that, uh, you know, if you have 30 shows and they're all... Uh, from people who've done, you know, 10 shows and won the BAFTA 20 times, mm. and then, you know, maybe you're not open to the revolutionary new show that may be coming along. Do you think you'll be much more in that business of signing people up on big output deals? I mean, it's very striking to see Shonda Rhimes go to Netflix. It's a huge loss to, to ABC and Disney. So is that the space you're in, in a sense, because it's getting so tough, you're going to have to lock down some of these big talent? Yeah, I think that's inevitable. Uh, I mean, we have Jill Soloway, and we just announced uh, Robert Kirkman, who created The Walking Dead. So we're going down that road as well, for sure. So I think it's a great time to be a big writer, producer, or an agent. <laughs> yeah. I, I interviewed John Langruff here a couple of years ago, and he has continued with um, his spiel, which I have some sympathy with. It, yes, on one level, it's a golden age of television, but on another level, there is such demand now for premium content at a very high tariff. There just isn't the supply. Is that where, where are you in that debate? Um, I don't know. I've never known what to make of that. I I think there's a lot of great TV, and I don't find that like the world is running out of ideas. So I'm, I'm not sure I relate to that, or maybe I don't understand it. I think I think it's a legitimate point. But isn't I've it? heard it many times. Yeah. Like peak TV and. We can't make any more TV. We're running out of catering or something. I, I don't understand. <laughs> like, I, I just haven't found that. I think. But you're, I think, so you're still seeing easily enough, extremely good ideas that are worth you making week in, week out. Yes, it turns out. Yeah, there are a lot of talented people, great actors. I think there's a lot of great work being done. Now you were talking very generously yesterday about about London and the UK sector, particularly against that backdrop. What are the gaps then for UK producers? Are there particular things that you think, yes, we were looking for that and we'd be particularly looking for it from this market? Or where would you suggest people concentrate their efforts? I only ask it because actually the non-scripted brief in the nice possible way is so broad, if I were a producer, I wouldn't know what to bring to you. So, so is there any bring more definition? Your biggest, most innovative idea. OK, only after you brought it to me and then bring yeah. it to me. Really? That's, that's the brief? Yeah, well, definitely an unscripted. Uh, in scripted, you know, American Gods uh, and Good Omens, I think, are, exam are good examples of uh, shows that really have scope and can be broadly popular and also cool and good. Uh, Preacher is similar, but, you know, Catastrophe and Fleabag are very different, and they're interesting because it's really high quality, real, and moving. And so anything in that spectrum, you know, can be great. I think it just has to be... I mean, it's, you know, I'm not sure we can be more specific, you know, but if you, if you want to avoid getting locked into like a particular thing and you want to remain open to something that is non-intuitive but great, then you can't lock yourself into too specific a creative brief. So, you know, if it's really different and um, innovative and new, but it could be big, we want to hear about it. 
And we've had great luck in, in the past with shows that were a little too something for everybody else, and they all passed. Uh, so that can be a great sign. You know, that can mean that it's, it really is sort of on the edge. And, uh, and that's, I think, where you need to be, or it has like too distinct of a voice. Uh, sometimes that can scare people off, or something about the premise seems, um, you know, a little too daring, like Man in the High Castle was that way, so a lot of people passed on that. So, um, so whether, you know, I mean, I, I think we should see it first, but... But your point is you're not an idiosyncratic platform there now, because that might have been where you started, but what you were saying earlier is you've got the same cross-subsidy issue everyone else has got. You need big, broad shows, and you yeah. need critically acclaimed, smaller shows that will help you with the churn. So, yeah. but, you're, but you're not a boutique player, you're a big, broad player. Yes, that's true. Okay. Just, I want to just ask you again on this Game of Thrones point. I have asked you several times, actually, increasingly not on this stage. I think you're trying to tell me something in code I don't understand, so I'm going to ask you again. What's, what is your point about Game of Thrones? That you think that we're getting to a point now where scale, shows of that scale, that have that cinematic ambition, need to be a defining part of a platform like yours? Is this like a nudge, nudge, wink, wink thing? No, you know, I, I think everybody wants to have one or more of one of the top five shows, the top ten shows. Yeah. You know, that's really what matters most. And uh, I think that show set a good example and uh, has really gone above and beyond in terms of you know, delivering uh, a big world with high stakes and it's exciting and everybody gets, gets behind it. And, uh, and I, I think as people focus on getting into the top five or the top 10, I think some of the constraints of the past will fall away in terms of cast or who participates or how much you spend. It, it'll be like, you know, we're going to get one of those shows, or more than one. So, um, anyone? Is I, that think, I think it's like an, a massive arms race type thing no. playing out that you will have a big channel defining or platform defining proposition in this space. That's what I take from it. Okay. Fine. I think it'll be an exciting few years in TV for sure. Okay, fine. Um, a few more questions now. This relates to something that Kevin Ligo, who uh, runs ITV creatively yesterday said. He said, in answer to the question, what is the future of situation comedy on ITV? He said, bleak. What is the future of comedy on Amazon, given the early offering Alpha House and Beta's skewed towards comedy? And that is true, isn't it? You started very much in that space and then have evolved over your sort of 31 shows into a broader drama slate as well. Well, you know, on the one hand, it's not a great time for comedy. Uh, um, you know, the really big dramas are, I think, driving the business, you know, for everybody. And there haven't been a lot of big hit comedies in the last few years. Um, but, you know, when I, uh, a few years ago, uh, you know, like in the mid 90s, it was the opposite. And, you know, no one, like, drama was totally uncool and it was all about comedy. And, and um, so these things do evolve. And just when everybody says, you know, it's really bleak for comedy or really bleak for drama or whatever, that's probably a good time to be thinking about that category. So you, you never want to write anything off. People love to laugh, and that will be true for a long time. But critically, in America, At it's least partly... For two months. Exactly. It, yeah. it often follows those big multi-camera pieces getting to syndication, don't they? So they've right. been hugely profitable. Very different dynamic for you. So are you saying that your level of commitment to comedy will remain where it is now, or can you imagine that being an expanded commitment, or how do you see that playing out? I don't know. There's no doubt that drama is... They're like the biggest shows for sure. Um, but, you know, next year the biggest show could be a half hour. It's, it's hard to say. So you have to remain open to it. But I think responding to recent experience, you'd probably tend to emphasize drama more. Okay, fine. What keeps you awake at night? This is uh, one on the app. What keeps you awake at night when you look at the next 12 to 18 months of Amazon Studios and what are you going to do to sleep better? That goes a bit weird in the end, that question, but let's just do the first bit. I don't want to know the last bit. <laughs> I don't want to know about that. Uh, let's see. Uh, what keeps me up at night? Um, you know, it just, it is competitive and uh, getting, getting the biggest ideas and the biggest creators and um, and making sure the show actually turns out. I mean, just the ordinary stuff of television, I, I suppose. Um, but when I look at the people we're working with, that, that is somewhat 
uh, calming, and then I get off to slumber. <laughs> <laughs> this is a leading one. You're making money while Netflix loses cash. What are you doing right? I just want to caveat that because that's a bit too much of an open goal for you. Um, one thing that's striking when you talk to Netflix, when you talk to, to you, you don't talk about the competition. Is that a deliberate decision? I mean, you said you're focusing on the consumer, but behind closed doors, Roy, you might sit there and say, bloody hell, I wish I'd got that show, or would have been good if we'd got Shonda Rhimes, or I wish I had, insert sure. name of, I wish I had Handmaids, I wish I had a, you know, a show that's popped up on another channel. Do you oh, yeah. have those conversations? Sure, you know, we should have had this one or that one, or, you know, you'd what like What should you have had? Is there something, is there one that got away? Is there one that keeps you awake at night? Uh, anything that's a hit we should have had, you know, <laughs> I, mean, I guess, you know, sure. We should have had Handmaid, Handmaid's Tale and, uh, you know, The Crown did, did well. Um, you know, so you look at all of those and you would like to have had, you know, every one of those shows. I, I thought The Young Pope uh, was brilliant. Um, Paolo Sorrentino is great, um, you know, so yeah, anything good, I, you know, chastise the team that they didn't pick it up. <laughs> it's, it's, your system's very different, isn't it, because it is much more of a circus, because you will get pitched all of those things, so that sense of having missed something must be very avert when that happens, isn't it? You can't say, as we can, we lost the treatment, the dog ate my homework, whatever it might be. You've sat there and heard the pitch and then someone else has picked it up, so is there an inquest when that happens? Well, I, I like to have a meeting at the end of every week called uh, the finger pointing meeting. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the important thing is that it never becomes my fault or my responsibility. Yeah. So, yeah. so for each bad thing, I identify one person on the team. And then you fire them. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. well, we all agree that it was their fault. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, so that's a fun meeting. We don't have a uh, attaboy meeting. <laughs> That does not exist. Uh, but yeah, I mean, what can you do? You can't get them all. This is a bit mean, but Roy was talking to me yesterday about how you deal with rejection when people are pitching in America. And I was saying to him, because the system is so different, it's quite interesting, I think, for UK producers to know how best to deal with things. And it's that great phrase that, you know, there are 128 ways of saying no in America, but all of them involve the word yes. So what tips have you, <laughs> what, what tips have you got for producers about how to deal with the American pitching system? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I'm not, I don't know why people don't record one pitch on video and then just send everybody a link at the same time. They don't have to run all around town and actually meet everyone and sit there and do it again and again. Uh, it could probably, you know, it would probably be a lot more efficient than people could just put bids in over the phone. It'd be great. Um... <laughs> This you is know, in no way dehumanizing, obviously. That's, no, it's, like, it's it, like eBay for programs. I've got a great show, bid, bid, bid. It's great for, it would be great for everybody. It's much more efficient. I, I also am happy to receive the script first, you know, and, and so, you know, we can go into it and have a more substantive conversation. I think the worst thing is where you get the beat by beat, you know, let me tell you about the pilot, and it's like one hour, it's like real time. It's like... <laughs> And then he looks to his left. Oh, his left, not his right? Um, you know, that's, that's more than you need. But if, but if I, on a serious note, actually, because I have the same experience, when people come and do American pitching to me, I'm dying inside. I hold onto the table like this thinking, please make it stop. Well, particularly when they do all the voices in, and that, that bit sort of is <laughs> But it, But honestly, are British producers at a disadvantage in that situation? Because it's an elaborate sort of circus, this, isn't it? You turn up, you, you sort of sell your wares very overtly and you show showrunner and blah, blah, blah. So if they turn up and do a classic self-deprecating Brit thing, is that going to get them out of the conversation? No, I'm sure it's the same. And they're sort of, you know, they're charming. They flew from far away. It's probably more interesting, you know. <laughs> it's probably an advantage, you know. The other thing you said to me yesterday, which I hope you don't mind me saying, but I thought was very funny, is the great advantage of being the top of a network is you can find any number of ways of having to avoid being the person who says no. Tell us about that. Right. Well, you know, I think one can sort of delegate that task and just always, <laughs> always be so sort of cheery and positive. And after the finger pointing meeting, we can identify who gets to pass on things. <laughs> and uh, typically, typically won't be me. What this means, so the virtuous circus is, a circle of this is that someone comes in and pitch, everyone sounds very enthusiastic, you then have your finger pointing meeting at which we identify the person who's going to break the bad news, then you can see this other person who's pitched for lunch and say, I know, 
I couldn't be right. more disappointed. I don't know how this has happened. They're the it's worst. Absolute, they're the worst. <laughs> I tried to sell it to the team, but they just weren't having it. Right. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Okay, sorry, I got carried away. Now let's go back to your questions. Uh, okay. But Ooh, the other thing is that all pitches should occur on the same day. It should be quarterly. It should be pitch day. Because the bad thing is when you hear something on Wednesday and you buy the show, so you've just spent millions of dollars and uh, then someone comes in on Friday and now you have budget problems and that's why you don't buy the show. Like it's just the luck of timing and that's, that's really sort of silly. Uh, it should be that everybody does it on video. They're all links. All the links go around on a particular day, you know, at 8 a.m., you get an email with all the links, and the team, you can divide them up, the team watches them, by the end of the day, you have your offer. But you can't do that, because then the person who's seventh, they get the after-lunch slump, don't they? So they don't get picked up, because you've bought something in the morning, because you thought I was feeling a little bit perky then, no, had a no. good night's sleep, it's all good, and now look what's happened. You'd have the buying meeting at the end of the day. What's really worrying is you spend a lot of time thinking about this. This no, isn't going to happen. Can I just be really clear? This it's not going to happen. No one's idea. doing this. This is the best Properly idea of all the best. time. Properly is the best happen. idea. Never going to happen. We could also, by the way, do that with like film festivals. <laughs> why we all have to convene in some obscure place, I have no idea. <laughs> Or Venice or Toronto, I think we call them. But yeah, um, OK, fine. Let me quickly look at some of the rest of these. Right, this is about VR, actually, which is an interesting space. Hello, Roy. Is Amazon looking to engage with VR for commission content? Uh, you know, we'll definitely do some experiments in that area. I think it'll be low volume at first, but, uh, but we'll do something in VR. It could be a lot of fun. It could be big. Are you prepared to expand on that at all? No. It's going to be limited for now. I don't think we're going to be buying like a lot of pitches, but you know, if there's something really interesting that, that could, be, uh, could have broad appeal, then let's talk about it. Send it on a video link, but only on a Tuesday. Is that that would be saying? awesome. Yeah, okay, fine. That would be so awesome. Crack, crack on with that. Um, very interesting one here, actually, about data and saying, is data all it's cracked up to be when you consider the polls got it wrong, particularly when it came to Brexit and to Trump? Ha! <laughs> Well, I mean, polls, I think, are a little different. Uh, data is real. That's like the vote. And uh, I mean, I suppose if you took a poll as to what TV show people are going to watch over the next week, you'd have similar errors, but, uh, or you could. But when you have the actual data of what people did, that's pretty reliable. How are you finding working creatively in Trump's America? I say that only because it's really striking to me. I, lots of American heads come through and I see them, and it seems to be foregrounded as a conversation in a way that I've not noticed before politically, that it has changed the landscape. Does it feel like that to you? Well, I, th I think people are, you know, conscious of politics, but um, I think you have to be a little careful of responding, you know, too much uh, to whatever is happening, you know, today or in this moment. You know, we're not sketch comedy. Uh, these are shows that hopefully will go on for years <laughs> and, uh, you know, or movies that will appear in a couple of years. So, so you can't be too topical or too responsive to the moment. You know, but do you, I, that Saturday night I think there's been a lot of hand-wringing in this market, I think probably rightly, about the, in fact, the McTaggart touched on it to a large extent, the extent to which the, that what's changed politically has shown that the creative community is disconnected with the audience as much as politicians were disconnected with the electorate. Do you have a sense of that? I mean, is that something that you're aware of? that there's a great raft of Americans that, that no one's making content for or that speaks to them? Or do you not think that's Amazon's job anyway? Hmm. I don't know. I haven't thought of that. Um, think now. Think quickly, Roy. I guess yeah. I'll, I'll think yeah. about that. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't know. You know, I, I don't really think a lot about the politics and how it might interact with us. I, I tend to get too concerned about you know, we can't get distracted by short-term, you know, stuff or stuff that might be interested, interesting for a few months. You know, we want these shows to last, you know, five, six, seven years, and I don't know what's going to be happening four or five years from now. So, so if it's too specific to the very moment we're in, you know, uh, we may have to leave that kind of topicality to sketch comedy and radio and you know, things that are more immediate. Okay. We're going to have to wrap up in a minute. Final question, and I know you're not a big future gazer, but just 
go with me here. So in the one year since you were last here, we've got massive new entrants, you with a much expanded slate of things that you're now putting on your platform. Cast forward even just a year, what do you think will have changed? Um, well, I think I'm going to uh, slim down over the next year. This is how okay. this started. When you all walked in, this is the conversation we're having. Roy's going on a um, diet. Okay, that doesn't count, Roy. That's not future gazing. I, uh, That's just a lifestyle decision. <laughs> That's no good to I, me. Uh, I, think, I think you can expect bigger shows. I think it's, it's you know, whether it's, you know, sport or unscripted or scripted television, uh, it's going to be ambitious and um, there's going to be a lot of great stuff, great stuff to choose from. Do you want to do the quick Prime ad again just before we go? Apparently it's brilliant. And, please, and subscribe to Prime. It's the best deal of all time and you can subscribe from your seat. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that, will do you? Do it. Um, don't do that. Um, can I say a quick thank you to our sponsors, uh, the British Film Commission and Creative Scotland, and a very, very big thank you to Roy Price. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. you.